Hello everyone, I'm Rumena. I'm Anna. And together we are Peach Preach, a feminist duo that works to promote women's oral history and juxtaposes it to traditional patriarchal history and even science, attempting to normalize issues and themes traditionally neglected or dismissed as female. Uh, moreover, one of our goals is to promote and give space to talented and competent women as public figures. Writing is traditionally one of the areas that women have been deemed not to have enough talent, interest, or time for. Starting from Virginia Woolf's prerequisite of having adequate material conditions in order to be able to write fiction, through Helen Sixou's pleas to invent a new style of writing and break free from the patriarchal confines of language, there has been an ongoing feminist discussion on women's writing and women as authors. Research and experience, and I'm talking about all of us here, <laughs> suggests that gender imbalance is still present in the literary world. Surprise, surprise. So we chose the topic writing women um, as the topic of our first international pitch preach, uh, which shines a light on women who write as well as the way that women are written about. Our uh, storytellers tonight are eminent writers from several countries who will tell us how their identities as writers and women intertwine and interact, and how they approach the writing process, as well as the process of reading texts and characters. Is there a possibility to subvert the literary tradition that canonizes men, all the while giving women the role of muses? And what would be the ways to confront patriarchy in literature, both in terms of form and content? So without further ado, I am very anxious, and so is Anna, I'm sure, to hear these, the our four storytellers tonight, and I will uh, introduce the first one. My very good friend Tahila Hakimi uh, from Israel. Uh, she's an award-winning Hebrew poet and fiction writer, participant of the 2018 Fulbright International Writing Program and the in University of Iowa Writing Program, uh, which is where I met you. <laughs> and um, for her first collection of poetry, she received a prize for emerging poets by the Ministry of Culture. And she's also a recipient of the 2015 Bernstein Prize for Literature. She's published a graphic novel and a collection of novellas and is a mechanical engineer by profession. So uh, we also got a chance to um, uh, read Tehila Hakimi in Macedonian. Uh, she was published by Blisok and by Medusa a couple of days ago. So Tehila, please go ahead. Welcome. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. And um, I must say that when Rumana invited me, uh, I immediately said yes, because uh, I um, admire Rumana and her work. But only later I thought, okay, what, what am I going to talk about? And, um, and then I wasn't so sure I'm gonna make it because I'm um, nine months pregnant, supposed to any, any day, any hour now, but uh, here I am. And I thought about uh, sharing few stories or experiences and I will start each one of those stories uh, in the same uh, way. Uh, it will go like that. It's, it will start one time I was the only woman in the room. And some of those stories are told uh, from, uh, from me as a writer point of view. But uh, like Ruman has said, I also have a career in engineering. So some of those stories are um, under the hat of the engineer. And it made me think, what difference does it make under which title I am sitting in a room uh, as the only woman in a room full of men? And what's better, uh, being the only engineer in the room, woman engineer in the room, or the only woman writer in the room? And what's the solution for this situation? So let's see if I will manage to solve all those problems in the time that I have. It goes like that. So one time I was the only woman in the room. It was a few years ago and the room was the living room of a friend's friend. I'm not sure if that's important, but my friend was a poet 
And the other guy, who this was his living room, is a director and a screenplay writer. So we were sitting there on the director's sofa, and it was a midday Tel Avivian summer. Maybe it wasn't summer, but I remember it was quite humid. Maybe it's just the way sometimes men's living, living room are humid. And regardless of the weather, we were talking, the three of us. I don't remember what the conversation was about, but from where I was sitting uh, on the sofa next to the poet, I could see the director's bookshelves. It was a huge wooden bookshelf directory that covered most of, of that wall, of one big wall. It was an old and beautiful one. And as expected, I, it didn't take long before I slipped out of our conversation and stood up, concentrated to see more closely what books he had on his shelves. This is the way I normally behave near books. I must see what, uh, what's, uh, what are the books on the shelves and if there's anything that I didn't know or something that I should add to my uh, reading list. And this guy, he had a lot of books on that wall, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands even. And after I was done scanning the whole wall, I returned to their conversation, interrupted them, and I asked the director, do you know what's missing on your shelves? And he looked at me a bit surprised, not sure at all what I was talking about. And then there was silence in his living room. And then I said, you have only two books written by women in your book collection. Did you know that? One time I was the only woman in the room. It was at work. And the room was our small meeting room where we had a coffee maker and a fridge with milk. Sometimes we had cookies. It was maybe 10 years ago when I was working on a huge project in which I managed the beta phase. On that morning, while sitting there, still alone, one of my, of my colleagues, uh, engineers, entered the room. He was accompanied by an American colleague of ours, someone who visited Israel. He came to look and learn because we had the new technology uh, in development and he came to be introduced to that technology. It was the American first morning in our office. Maybe it was his first time in Israel. After greeting me with good mornings, they approached the coffee corner. Then my Israeli colleague said to the American one, we will have to make our coffee by ourselves today. The blonde girl that serves coffee didn't come to work today. My Israeli colleague was giggling and the American one, not so, maybe embarrassed, maybe still half jet lagged. One time, it wasn't me though, I saw a woman sitting on a stage behind a table she was the only woman on that stage. She's a well-accomplished literature researcher. And on that occasion, she was one in a committee of three judges for an important literary prize. Except for her, there was another judge and the head of the committee behind the table. The, mo the moderator sat on a chair in the right corner of the stage. Then when presenting the committee members, the head of the committee, I'll just call him head for convenience, listed the two male judges by their name and their titles. So the head presented Professor David, let's say, and the book reader, critic Moses. But when presenting the woman member of the committee, right after mentioning she is a researcher with a PhD, Dr. Shoshana, he went on saying he never calls her Dr. Shoshana, but only in her first name. And then he gave her a nickname, an affectionate one, like when you give someone close to you, a dear friend, a daughter, a niece. So I think these three incidents or uh, stories uh, can give me a small opportunity to discuss the idea of being the only woman in the room in three measures or maybe in three 
existing planes. One is the workspace. Uh, in this particular story in a high-tech company in Israel, who persistently so proudly present itself as the startup nation. The second is the literature audience, the people who buy books and read them, or maybe just put them on their shelves. The third is the literature sphere, the small literature swamp, as we call it here. Now, what I'm doing here is not careful as I'm taking three specific occasions and I convert them or project them on three spheres, but I'm allowing myself that permission because as being the only woman in the room on so many occasions, I identify those occasions as realities. It's day to day. And one, one wall of bookshelves is in, in one specific living room is actually 100 or, or 1000 walls of bookshelves in many privately owned libraries and public ones too, in the public publishing houses and so on. And the key in each of these anecdotes is the act of silencing and being silenced. And it's easier to silence a woman when she's the only woman in the room. But in the end of all of that, it's all violence, hidden, grotesque, or camouflaged with niceness. So what is worse? Which title is better being under? I'm asking myself, is it better to be the only woman engineer in the meeting room or only the only woman writer on stage? I'm not sure because it's not easy being either. But I think it's worse when violence is disguised as something else. So as ugly or offensive, a grotesque comment in a workspace might be, at least it's out in the open and not camouflaged. You hear it immediately, it's there. Now, I'm not sure if it's possible to solve all our problems tonight because, well, it involves the demand for the end of patriarchy and equal rights for women, not just in the book of laws, but in practice, in real life, at home, at work, on bookshelves. But I promise to give some solution to this situation of what might happen when you are the only woman in the room or on stage, or to try and light this issue of having only one or two women writer on a whole wall of bookshelves, when people think that this is normal, Nothing is missing there. This is the way pe people read. What can you do? Maybe to begin with, I find it hard to separate, to separate being a woman writer from being a woman engineer or just being a woman. This is why most of my books focus on the issue of being a woman at work and the workspaces are used for investigating narratives and languages, but also questions of class and power, but still, I want to give one solution that fits all spheres. So as a woman writer, I say to other writing women, take time to be the only person in a room when you can, when possible. Like Virginia said, if not a room, at least a desk, then sit down and write your fiction, prose, poetry, essays, put the effort into it, your talent, your brilliancy. And after it's perfect, publish your books. It's really important to publish them. Then make them visible to the world. While doing that, encourage other women writers to write and publish too. Buy their books. Put them on your, on your bookshelves. Invite them to your book launches, fiction and poetry events. Sit with them on that stage. Like this one right now we are sitting in now, all women. And this maybe might start be the kind of a solution I might su suggest. <laughs> so this was me. Thank you, Tehila, so much. <laughs> this was very moving. And Thank after this, much. I encourage everyone to just uh, see um, how many women are on your bookshelves. <laughs> <laughs> a very important point. And the images, the striking images that you painted are unfortunately probably very relatable for most, if not all of us here. 
And one of the things that yeah, may be a flip side or at least one of the very few advantages of being in, in this position of being the only woman uh, in the room might be that it's so easy to slip in the shoes of other people who are outsiders or who are underdogs and maybe make some alliances which are outside of the existing power structures and maybe it gives us a glimpse or uh, I don't know of new ways to subvert the ongoing power structures but very moving thank you very much I think that all of us have felt it uh, have at least once been uh, the, the only woman in the uh, in the room in the workspace or on a stage and yes the feeling is quite overwhelming thank you very much thank you uh, so, can I just add something, you know, um, I, I really liked also what you said about violence and, and, it, and you know, pretending that it's not. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to draw attention to how frequently it's camouflaged with humor and ugly jokes, because when we were also talking about this, um, this event, we, we got that kind of like on television, that kind of ha ha, you know, men um, basically uh, demeaning our experiences uh, through through humor and then just saying it's a joke, but it's outright violence. So thank you also for, for, for talking about that. Okay, we proceed now to our next storyteller. Uh, we have Fiona Sampson, who is a leading British poet and writer published in 38 languages and who has received a number of awards in the US, India and Europe. Uh, she has published 27 books and is an emeritus professor of the University of Roehampton, where she and she has also served on the Council of the Royal Society of uh, Literature. Among other things, she, among other awards, uh, she has recently received the 2019 Frasheri uh, Award and uh, the European Lyric Atlas Prize in Bosnia. She is a uh, broadcaster and news, newspaper critic, a librettist and literary translator, and was the editor of the Poetry Review 2005 to 2012. More recently, she has written the biography of Mary Shelley, which is a book that I am about to start reading, thanks to Rumana, and uh, she has written about the life uh, of Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Both, uh, so please, without any further ado, I give the floor to our next storyteller, Fiona Sampson. Fiona. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Anna and Rumana, for the invitation. It's, it's really great to be almost in Macedonia, a place of, about which I have lots of fond memories. And thank you, Anna, also for mentioning Susu in your whistle-stop survey of you know, the ways we think about ourselves as writing women. Because um, when I was an undergraduate, she came to my university, she came to Oxford, and she, she spoke and her lecture, her talk was uh, life-changing for me. I mean, it wasn't that I hadn't studied her before, but her talk was um, a great kind of cry of liberation. I mean, obviously she's talking about play and multiplicity and, and, and so on. And um, I was finding studying philosophy at Oxford very um, logocentric, very monolingual, very narrow, very costive, very constipated, very anxious and defensive. Um, that kind of Anglo-American logical positivism, which um, is based on logic and is opposes itself to continental philosophy, which takes the risk of thinking there might be a world with, with which we are in relation, is very it's very gendered. It's very gendered in who teaches it and who gets to stay on it and do it. And it's also, I felt like I was dying. It was incredibly oppressive to try and remember that I was a poet because I'd gone to Oxford as a mature student at the old age of 25, um, in surrounded by this kind of sense of not only who ought to speak, but how one ought to speak. And, um, and I do think that the question of authority is an incredibly complicated and dangerous one for us as women and for us as women writers. Um, one of the things that I increasingly notice quite anecdotally is that we don't, this, is, this occasion is wonderful, but we don't tend to do for each other what the boys do for each other. And 
what we don't do is pass on the baton or the mantle that's a mixed metaphor sorry of authority we empower everyone in the room which we should i mean i think that's right but we don't say this woman this individual woman is fantastically able or fantastically distinguished or fantastically promising and the boys do do that for themselves so when i look at you know i i'm mid-generation now when i look at the men who are my at my stage of professional development they all have disciples they all have young men who hang on their every word or at least their every publication and who can always be wheeled out to big them up to write reviews and who just kind of give them affirmation all the time over beers in the pub i mean they just live in this bubble of affirmation and when we work across the generations when we it, it always feels like friendship now that is incredibly good that's an incredibly good different model but it's not an authoritative model and so the younger women i work with i notice nearly always once they've got what they wanted they they kind of disappear. They think that they have outgrown the mentor and they have, they've outgrown the mentorship relationship, but they haven't outgrown the kind of family tree of mutual support that goes up and down the generations. Um, one of the things that you also mentioned in your very, very generous um, introduction, Anna, was that um, I used to be the editor of Poetry Review and Poetry Review is the periodical of record for poetry in Britain and it has vastly larger distribution than any other poetry magazine and it's been going for um, sort of 110 years now and it is published by the National Poetry Society and um, when I became the editor which was one of these not in a smoke-filled room appointments but of transparent process with observers of the interview process because it was publicly funded um i was only the second woman editor in its history and there hadn't been another woman editor since muriel spark in 1947 to 49 and of course this is so obscene in a way that it was reported you know, the national press when they reported it couldn't believe it so they said that Muriel Spark was an editor from 1974 to nine, rather than 1947 to nine. They just couldn't believe how long ago it was. And to become an authority figure was immediately to become controversial, even though I knew I was the only literary editor in poetry in London, who was reading the slush pile, who was reading the unsolicited submissions of which I was getting 60,000 every year. And that I was also, um, I, I did that thing about friendship and let's informalize our launches and making contact with me. When I say the editor, I mean, I was the editor in chief. There was only, there is only one editor. We don't have large mastheads on literary magazines in Britain and despite my actual attempts in terms of who I published to democratize to publish new people there was this tremendous anxiety around me and the source of my authority so there was all schools of, there were a lot of there was a lot of speculation about who I must be sleeping with and who in whose pocket I was, whose puppet therefore I was, because there was absolutely no model of women writers having the literary intelligence to be able to be good literary editors. It just doesn't exist in the British model. And that is partly because of course, it's partly everywhere in the world, but it's also partly because Britain luckily but unluckily in this respect, hasn't ever had any social engineering. So we are still stuck in that pre-revolutionary moment. Great, we haven't had the appallingness of, you know, of the French Revolution or Stalinism or whatever, but we are still stuck in, you know your place and you stay there. And we have very few um, female authority figures, certainly in the arts. I mean, I remember going to Romania in maybe about 15 years ago 
And I went, um, you know, I went for work. I was, um, I can't remember what I was doing, but it was definitely work and it was all meetings with writers and doing readings and so on. And a fr my friend, who was a woman poet, Ioanna Yeranim, the Romanian poet, um, said, well, I'll take you to meet the director of the National Theatre. So the National Theatre in Bucharest. And it did not cross my mind that it could be a woman. And it was a woman. And, you know, I'm a feminist, but I come from a culture in which still to be at the top of the pyramid, you are a man. I mean, that is still the case. And that is so normalized and so internalized at every level from um, the casting couch, which certainly is the case across the arts. It's not just in the theater and very live to, um, yeah, this sense of we don't create a line of tradition for ourselves, which is not a kind of secondary line of tradition, but a line of tradition within the tradition, within, as it were, the grand tradition, whatever that is, whether that's fiction or literary nonfiction or poetry or whatever, engineering, you know, whatever. We just don't do it. So I am nearly always the only woman in the room and I hate it. And I don't think, I think that I have probably made lots of compromises and I think that my literary foremothers have too. I mean, I do adore Virginia Woolf and I remember walking around Paddington Station in rapture at, at the age of about 13, just kind of sleepwalking because I was reading Virginia Woolf and I thought, at last there is someone who who writes the way I think that this, this is the experience of the world. Of course, now that's lots of things about modernism and the modernist technique of um, free association and so on, but it's also coming back to that dichotomy between the Anglo-American anxious philosophy and the kind of anxiety of naming, which we know is phlogocentrism and the, the more fluid, um, creative and shifting polymorphous relationship to language, perhaps a semiotic element in language that we might have as women. Um, it's clearly there in Wolfe. But Wolfe was not generous to Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And I have just spent two, three years working on Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And I'm just going to sort of kind of fold back by just talking a little bit about that. Um, I was a very reluctant literary biographer and I reversed into it because I'd been asked as a sort of, you know, mainstream central, whatever, British poet to be part of a series where British poets were, living poets were preparing a reader's, contemporary reader's edition of a canonical poet. And I was asked to do Percy Bysshe Shelley, and I was extraordinarily resistant. He's very unfashionable, quite apart from the fact that he's a man and quite apart from the fact of his sexual politics. But he was the only one on offer for me. And I'm so glad I did it because in doing it, of course, like any form of close reading, I began to find ways into his work and became very interested in him as a kind of philosopher of change. But because of that, in 2016, when the Frankenstein by centenary was on the horizon and was in the minds of literary editors, I was commissioned out of the blue to write a literary biography of Mary Shelley. In fact, I was asked to write anything you want to write about Mary Shelley for publication in 2018. And because I am a woman in Britain and therefore I have a lot of internalized self-disciplines, I did not want to do something which was terribly reflexive and was my journey into Mary Shelley. But of course I was making a journey into Mary Shelley and of course it was making me think about my writing self. So I ended up writing a psychological biography of Mary Shelley because I wanted to work out for myself how I believed she could, as a teenager, have created a myth, which is something which usually takes centuries and more than one society, and two enduring archetypes. As we know, the overreaching scientist and the nearly human whom we, the, whom we other. And because of that, and because that went well, in 2018, when it came out, then the publishers said to me, well, what are you going to do next? And 
To me, it was a no brainer. I wanted to write a biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning because she is an absolutely central canonical figure in 19th century British literature and poetry. And when I was a kid, you know, she was in the anthologies. It was just like Tennyson or Wordsworth. I mean, she wasn't a romantic like Wordsworth, but she was an absolutely central figure. And what a revelation that has been, because despite the fact that, you know, the biography is now out and so on, and despite the fact that it's got lovely press and all of that and very, very nice, the resistance from literary editors, male literary editors, to seeing her as a literary figure has been astonishing. What they have wanted to do is to make her um, a figure with an interesting life story. And that's partly because there was a, an incredibly successful series of Hollywood films and an incredibly successful series of made for TV dramas and a Broadway hit, all called The Barretts of Wimpole Street, which are about Elizabeth Barrett Browning as this kind of passive lady who's all body. She's swooning and unhealthy. And she has this very strict father who keeps her prisoner. And then her dashing young poet husband comes along and sweeps her off to Italy. And that's the making of her, which, of course, eliminates her agency and also eliminates the actual body of her work. Um, so it was very hard. I wanted to produce a reader's edition of her poetry to go with biography. No, impossible. We couldn't find, we couldn't find a publisher. Um, and the reviews have been great, but there has been tremendous resistance to kind of essay pieces and so on. And that's because people are interested in the populist story. Well, why? Why is it that the woman who wrote the first Bildung's Roman, the first story of how a woman becomes a woman, a person becomes a person, which is by a woman and about a woman, and also the first Kunstler Roman, the first story of how um, someone becomes a maker that was by a woman and about a woman, that's to say Aurora Lee, and who influenced generations of writers from Emily Dickinson to Virginia Woolf, but also a lot of men, Oscar Wilde, John Ruskin, Carlyle. How come we can't let her stay weightily in the canon, taking up the space of someone like Tennyson, who seems to me a poet who's rather similar. Their poetics developed in tandem and they've both got massive weak spots as well as amazing strengths. Why? As with Mary Shelley, do we have to try and believe that the husband actually wrote the wife's work? Why do we still have to think that Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote Frankenstein or most of it or turned it into something viable? When we have the Frankenstein notebooks, you know, in Mary's handwriting with Percy's small marginalia, why do we have to say that Robert Browning is the poet? He is the poet Browning. And then there was this kind of uh, tangential finger, figure, this addenda, Elizabeth, who is his lady wife. Why can we, of both genders, why can we not bear their authority? And I don't have many answers. I don't have any answers, really. But one thing I did notice when I was working on Elizabeth was that she, her story, unlike Mary Shelley's, which is a story of the unconscious, is a story of the conscious. It's very will. This is someone who wrote, she knew she was writing about the against the grain of her time. She chose to write under her own name as a woman when all the Jane Austens, the Charlotte Brontes, were, the George Eliots, the George Sands even were not doing so. She uh, was political. She was... Um, <coughs> She, she, she was basically an autodidact. It's a tremendous act of will that got her into the position she wanted, which was to be a poet of great gift and accomplishment, as well as reputation, international reputation. So hers is a story about consciousness. And when I put those two women together, and I can't help doing that because they were born only nine years apart, and they yet they are so, one is so clearly a romantic, one is so clearly a Victorian and they war against each other in my mind, and yet they have so many affinities. What I think is that writing biography 
does allow me as a woman to think about writing women and it does act as a mirror. And I think that that mirror is not a true mirror, it's a two-way mirror of the kind they use in interrogation cells and of the, entire, the kind that I used to use when I worked in mental health hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, where um, the patient would be seeing themselves in the mirror, but not knowing that behind the mirror, they could be observed because biography, like all portraiture seems to me to be like that. We gaze at them, but we don't meet their eye because they don't know we're looking at them. And that is a tremendous sense of not quite solidarity, of asymmetry, which is so similar to our experience with other writing women who are alive and are around us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. Really, I mean, I'm so glad you talked about these two women. First of all, I, you know, I, I, ha I haven't managed to get my hands on the Elizabeth Barrett Browning book, but I did. <laughs> I really loved the Mary Shelley one, and you know, it it gets me also thinking about essentially about also what you talked about, basically this women not passing on the baton, which we're trying to do in a way. Wonderfully, um, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, regionally we've been also trying and one of the things that kind of spurred this um, this topic, actually the theme of this particular Writing Women was also that I was speaking to a friend uh, of mine, Lana Bastasic, who's a wonderful writer from Bosnia. And uh, she, she told me um, about a situation where an interviewer, you know, the editor of a newspaper, was, oh, I'm not sure, so sure if I should, I didn't ask her if I should say Go this. on. It doesn't matter, now it's too late. Um, but essentially, she was asked like a question by, a, by, an, in, by some editor who was a male who kind of imposed the question on her. You know, does, is there, isn't there, he said, a clique of women writers who support each other on Instagram and Facebook? And, you know, this is so shocking to say as an accusation when they hold these men all the institutions and they are the editors of everything yet we are problematic because we tend to you know we tend to not promote for money or anything like we like each other's work and we know we see each other as you said this mirror form you know writing about each other reading each other you know you see yourself and you see other women writers through it you know it's essential to you know we, we do this out of love and because we want to promote other women um, because we see that it hasn't happened also in history. So mm -hmm. yet they have all the institutions, but still this irks them insanely. So I don't know. Yes, I was, I was... this wonderful insight into writing as a process in context, in a particular context, but somehow in a very general context as well. That's one of the things that I really enjoyed. It can be applied. Yes, the British context is quite particular, but it, I can make a lot of parallels with our context mm. here. Yeah, especially in the past, the only women. This is a, another way to look at it. But the only women, the only women who it got sufficient uh, sufficient attention of the public to be in a way canonized were the ones who are the daughters or wives of already established, famous, you know, in the smoky room <laughs> of decision making. Uh, Absolutely. Or, so yes, uh, it's it was a really lovely insight, and this inter generational and even between women who are long gone passing symbolical passing of the pattern lovely thank you very much i really enjoyed you thank you i just also want to add that fiona samson has been translated into macedonian by our, one of our best poets um i think also in the past you know if i can generally in macedonian poetry magdalena Korva, who's also an amazing um an amazing translator. And uh, the book was published in 2005 called in Macedonian, The Lecina Tamegunas, The Distance Between Us. And you can also read that on our sister website, Medusa. So a shout out to our, to our sisters from Medusa as well. Thank All right. You. Yes, thank you, Magdalena. All right, so let's move on with uh, our next storyteller. My very good friend, Rasha Kayat is here. Uh, she is a German novelist, essayist and translator and also editor. Um, she, uh, uh, in 2006, she published her debut novel, no, I'm going to say it in, in German, Weil wir längst woanders sind, okay, <laughs> which has since been translated <laughs> into French and Arabic. She writes also uh, essays for the major German newspaper Die Zeit and uh, also for the public radio stations VDA and Deutsch, uh, Deutschlandfunk. Yes. 
She has received various awards and prizes for her work and currently lives in Ham Hamburg, where she is writing her second novel. So Rasha, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and to be here. I mean, I would rather be in Macedonia with all of you on the stage, obviously. And also I want to thank my uh, two fellow storytellers before me. That was really very, very inspiring, especially Fiona. Thank you because of the story about the female baton passing, like my uh, other lady friend writers here. I found that very, very inspiring. It took notes. So uh, I'm trying to keep that in mind. Um, and I just realized uh, when I was listening to my uh, fellow uh, storytellers here that I am actually I'm going to talk about men, which is kind of weird for a feminist uh, storytelling hour, but I hope you're going to enjoy it nonetheless. Um, and I made a couple of notes because I'm not an English native speaker, so um, I hope you forgive me that I glance at my notes one once in a while. And because as a matter of fact, I was actually, when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about, my first idea, because I'm kind of researching an article about that at the moment, I wanted to talk about money. Because making money as a female writer, as a writer in general, as a person in general in the arts, but as women writers especially, I thought it's just a topic that is never discussed and that we should talk about money more often and more openly. But then something happened, as so often does, and I had a phone call from a very dear friend of mine from America, a lovely lady writer who I've met a few years back, I think now, at a residency in the Hudson Valley in upstate New York. So we were sharing memories and reminiscing, and we were laughing about all the weirdness that happened over there. And after that, I thought, okay, I'm changing my mind about my story I'm gonna tell you tonight. Um, because I'm going to talk about what I call the species of the creepy lit biz dudes, which is literature business dudes, obviously. Because us female writers, we have to combat these, this type of guy or this type of dude quite a lot. So I hope you're going to enjoy my little story. I mean, obviously, uncomfortable and, and aggressive charged encounters with creepy dudes is absolutely nothing new for any woman. I dare you to show me one single woman who hasn't had an experience with your average creepy dude. But I mean, maybe my fellow writers will agree that among writers, I feel the ratio of these creepy lit dudes is especially high. And I can see from the way they are laughing that they actually agree. And I can't wait to share with them what experience they had. I mean, I could tell you also about an experience I had as a very, very young woman. I was barely a writer then. I was attending a reading with a girlfriend of mine of a very famous male German playwright and novelist. And after the event, he really creeped up on us. He stuck to us like a leech, you know, making very uncomfortable innuendos, touching my hair, you know, looking at my legs. I was wearing a short dress. So I finally escaped and made my way home. And then I found out that he already had looked me up on Facebook and texted me about the possibility of having a threesome with my friend and I. Obviously, I instantly deleted him and reported him and blocked him. Of course, what else would I have done? I could also tell you about a very established literary translator who sat across from me at a dinner at one time and made one sexually charged clumsy comment after the other. Later, he tried, me to text, he tried to text me as well, also via social media and also blocked, of course. And then a few weeks later, and you have to really digest this, appeared unannounced at one of my events where he followed me around all night and pointing out the effort he had made traveling all the way from Vienna to Hamburg, especially to attend my event. Dude, that's flat out stalking. It's creepy, not charming, is what I should have said. Instead, because I was so flabbergasted, I simply left my own event. And I mean, I received a prize that night and I just wanted to leave because I wanted to avoid the creepiness. I could tell you about all those times a journalist creeped up too closely, a moderator maybe touched my leg unwarrantedly while I was sitting on a stage, or about the publisher who gave me my very first job in publishing when I was 25 and who frequently sat next to me during meetings and literally breathed down the neckline of my sweater. By the way, he later married an intern when he was already in his 50s, obviously. But I wanna take you back to that residency in the Hudson Valley. It was my first international residency as a successfully published writer, a residency with an incredible reputation and understandably, I mean, I was really excited. 
I was excited to get out of the small German scene, which can be very annoying at times. I'm guessing all literary scenes are quite annoying. And then I got my first damper before I even got there. Because it turned out I didn't even escape the scene at all. I looked at the list of my fellow residents and I recognized someone I knew. It was a dude from Berlin who I didn't really like. He had been pretty arrogant and snobbish to me in the past and made derogatory comments about my work. What the hell, I thought, you know, we're going to be 12 other people. I'm sure we can avoid each other. And when I got there, I just couldn't believe my luck. It was so, so beautiful. The grounds were large and extensive and green and calm and everything gorgeous you can think about, like with trees and flowers. And it was just really, really, really lovely. We were housed in like very, very small cottages, like a single um, small writer groups per cottage. It was like in paradise. Like from my window, I could see deer. I could see rabbits like jumping up and down in the garden. It was absolutely beautiful. There was a small swimming pool even. There was a bicycle rack for us to use. We had a main house with a library and a kitchen where we could have like our communal dinners. It's just paradise, you know. So who cares about the dude in, of Berlin anymore? And I couldn't have been luckier with my cottage mates as well. Three really lovely ladies, writers from Spain, the US and Montenegro. And we hit it off immediately, like the first day we met. And I thought, oh, it was, this is going to be amazing. Six weeks in this environment with these really nice ladies. Later that first day, we met the other residents and they resided in two other cottages for the dinner in the main house. Apart from us ladies and the dude from Berlin, there were, among others, like two other men in their 60s. Another German, he was rather polite and quiet. And then there was Fred. Fred, the boisterous poet and translator from Ireland. His name wasn't really Fred, of course. Berlin dude and the other German and Fred frequently, sorry, quickly formed a clique. A very manly, like testosterone driven clique. They were telling each other stories and anecdotes about their glory days. And Fred was the one who was really vocal. He was always saying, ah, oh, I'm Irish. That's why I'm such a great storyteller in his very own not so humble opinion, if you know what I mean. He put on an extra thick accent for extra drama and he would always quote poetry over our dinners. He would not shut up. And Fred looked like a hobbit. I mean, he was small and gray and I always assumed that he was a drinker but he was blessed with the ego and vanity like nobody else. So, I mean, obviously the, lady and I, the ladies and I quickly became really annoyed with Fred and very, very bored, very, very quickly. He was just so entirely unpleasant to be around. Like every chance he got, he popped up near us. Whether one of us was trying to sit outside and read or two of us heading out and to, for a walk in the woods, even by the pool where I went every morning, very, very early, Fred was always there. He was there and he brought his stories and he brought a whole lot of mansplaining about literature. And even when we told him very politely, as we did regularly during these first few days, that we just wanted some peace or we, want, we weren't in the mood to chat even or trying to work or whatever, Fred just saw it as an invitation to try even harder to get our attention. Our eye rolls became more and more apparent, our rejection more rigorous. And since Fred had his manly click around him, we felt forced to split away from almost the entire group. But I mean, to be honest, we were quite fine with that. So we started eating our meals at our cottage, just the four of us. And in the evening, we just tried to, clear, st tried to stay clear from those dudes. But it became clear very quickly how much they disliked us constantly and increasingly ignoring them keeping conversations with them to a bare minimum. And the more we seemed to enjoy ourselves with each other and the more comfortable we seemed not to pay them any attention, the more aggressive their energy towards us became. They seemed so entirely puzzled and egged on by the fact that we seemed to enjoy each other's company so much more than their infinite blabber and really, really lame jokes. So of course, one day Fred decided to camp out in front of our cottage. I can't remember which one of us saw him first. I only remember a sudden knock on my door and one of my friends outside. Have you had a look outside yet? And her face, it was just like utter disgust. And surely there he was, 
Early in the morning, Fred had pulled up a deck chair right in front of our front door of our cottage, and now the, there he was sitting, pages of his manuscript in his lap and pretending to work. I mean, I want to be clear. The grounds were really, really large, and there would have been so many places for him to sit and work, either in the sun or in the shade, whatever he wanted. So the choice to camp out in front of our front door was really hostile. The four of us gathered in our little tea kitchen and shared our disbelief, and some of us were really outraged, others were more amused. I just thought, what the actual fuck was he trying to achieve? We decided just to leave him there and hope that he would move after a while. In vain, I'm afraid. He never left the chair all day. And I mean, that in itself is creepy, right? Like, did he never have to use the bathroom or anything? At some point, we wanted to get food from the main house. So should we just leave and walk silently past Fred? Then, well, we decided to escape through the sliding door in my room and walk around the cottage and cut through to the main house. Fred just lazily lifted his head, saw us across the way, but didn't move an inch. We entered the cottage the same way we had left it, through my room. We shared our outrage of this passive aggressive behavior with a couple of glasses of wine and we went to bed. The next day, and I'm not even joking, Fred was back in the chair in front of our door. At this point, my friend from Montenegro wasn't having it anymore. She resolutely walked past Fred multiple times that day, in and out of the cottage, without even looking at him. On the third day, she got up extra early and moved the deck chairs away from our entrance and behind our cottage. The event was never mentioned by Fred, of course. He just continued to laugh smugly, clearly pleased that he had managed to annoy us and distract us from our work for a couple of days. It's probably not surprising that we didn't talk to Fred for all the remainder of our time there. Later, I heard that my friend from Montenegro actually reported the incident to the residency director, who somewhat apologized for this inconvenience, but pretty much made it clear we shouldn't take it so seriously because, I mean, sure, Fred was joking. Looking back at those weeks in Hudson, I mainly remember the deer and the beautiful trees and the friends I made there. And I took a call from my friend in America the other day to even remember Fred and his shenanigans. But the minute I remembered, my rage was just as red and hot and fresh as it had been back in the day. I often wonder why the literary field especially seems to be rich with this type of creepy dude, full of vanity and ego, which at times might be confused with something akin to charm. I mean, not in Fred's case, obviously, and yet so incredibly boring, annoying, and really weak at the core, particularly when faced with a superpower that is the combination of female confidence and intelligence, and especially when we run in a pack. This is when they crumble, you know, and the only weapon in their douche arsenal is the kind of passive aggressive behavior, such as stalking or camping out in front of doors. I can't say that Fred was the last of the breed of the creepy lit dudes that I had and uh, that I have met since I came back from Hudson. I have met a fair few since, and I'm sure I will meet quite a few in the future. My hope and strength and relief is and will always be my female power pack. My lady writer friends here and at home and abroad, and I was lucky. I was lucky to meet quite a few of them over the past few years. A couple of which are actually present right here, and I'm really grateful for them. It's great to have that feeling like you always have those kinds of sisters by your side, and it has made me stronger and smarter and more courageous and a much better writer. So from my experience, I absolutely believe in female power sharing. I'm beyond grateful for all the women writers in my life who share their wisdom with me, who commiserate in awful experiences and who share my joy, who lift me up and inspire me all the time. So in closing, I can only encourage every young woman writer to find herself a sisterhood of like-minded women because only then we can maybe, and only maybe once and for all eliminate the species of the literary creepy dude. Thank you. Thank you, Asha, that was really great. <laughs> Let's hope, yes, that the powerful sisterhood will replace for, <laughs> I'll go for a mild world, uh, word, replace the creepy dudes from all walks of life, <laughs> because really all they do is take up space and annoy, and some of them are even more violent, and I wouldn't even want to think of all the possible outcomes that happen, unfortunately, every day because of the way that, I don't know, men uh, and boys are socialized and raised to claim space, to occupy when there's clearly a boundary set. 
you know, some boundaries are not to be pushed through. Thank you very much. Yes, we've all had uh, a fair share of our creepy dudes and you've painted them in a very nice way. Can I also we had our own creepy dude in Vélez in an event <laughs> who had a sketch on our event uh, with his walking cane uh, and tried to menace and tell us how stupid we were. But luckily Rumena chased him off, I believe. <laughs> Can yeah. I say one thing is, is that um, I always find the one uh, bit in Pride and Prejudice very, very inspiring when Elizabeth Bennet, when uh, Elizabeth Bennet is in the room with uh, at the Bingley's with uh, Mr. Darcy and the sister of Mr. Bingley and Mr. Bingley's sister asks, ah, oh, what should we do to punish Mr. Darcy because he's so arrogant, blah, blah, blah. And Elizabeth Bennet just says, we should just laugh at him. And I always feel like that's the that's the best solution. Just point at them, and because they're so ridiculous, you know. I mean, should just yeah. imagine like when I remembered this whole story, which actually happened, of this like hobbit-like dude sitting in front of our cottage, you know. I know. It's, I'm, you know, it, laughter is a great way to um, keep them away, or it's a strategy against this this kind of menace. Uh, but I, I really hate that we have to have strategies that, you know, that whatever, whatever the case, you know, it always will take up a bunch of your energy to just go around, to not look at the guy, you know, he's camping in front of your bungalow, you know, he is encroaching onto your space, you know, he's man spreading. And, you know, it's, it's like any of those things that we were talking about also with, you know, Pishpurich and our teeth also, we were, we were discussing women in the public space and how, you know, we're constantly having to find different ways to walk or find different ways just to move around to exist in order to avoid these creepy dudes that, as Anna said, can sometimes turn violent. You know, even just not looking at them is also an effort because, you know, I cannot even have a free gaze because Fred is there, you know? And these are, these are you know, regardless, you know, your story is extremely funny and obviously I love narratives about hideous, uh, ridiculous men. So, um, I mean, but, it, but it's always at the core of these comic narratives, there's something ext extremely violent, in fact, that's um, and menacing, so. And thank you really Absolutely. for your concern. Yeah, thank you so much, Rasha. All right. Okay, so tonight the last uh, storyteller we have is comes from Moscow, and she's Alisa Ganieva, an author of fiction and essays. Uh, she's a winner of the debut prize, a major literary award for young writers. Her novels have been shortlisted for some uh, well-known na national literary awards. Uh, for uh, best long story of the year and best short story of the year and so on. And uh, her work has been translated into several languages and has garnered warm feedback in many countries from critics, scholars, and the public alike. She is also a human rights activist uh, fighting for the rights of political prisoners. Alisa, without any further ado, please tell us your story. Good evening. I'm extremely thrilled to be on this panel. Uh, thank you very much for organizing uh, I think our today event is, uh, would be a part of this uh, international network and it's very important to weave uh, a female network and make the female voice to sound clearer and louder. And um, uh, I really can relate to what uh, Tehila and uh, Fiona and Russia have been telling us today. And, uh, when uh, Tehila uh, was talking about um, a doctor, a female doctor who was introduced as um, uh, by her first name and with a funny uh, domestic nickname, um, I also thought about uh, various ways of um, myself being introduced on panels and literary discussions um, uh, when when five or six uh, male writers um, were telling about, about each other, were extolling each other's uh, virtues. Um, this is what Fiona was talk talking about, um, about this um, temptation to boast among um, uh, male authors. And they were saying, this is a serious and prominent writer, Z, and this is another uh, well-known author, Ygrik, and uh, this is our charming Alisa, or this is our um, nice uh, 
decoration of, uh, of our talk, of our panel. And this is our adornment. And uh, notwithstanding of uh, my, my contribution to the discussion, I was, uh, I, I always, um, I was always uh, introduced that way as, uh, as a mere uh, adornment um, and not part of a discourse. Uh, and, um, and also when Fiona mentioned um, the question about whom you are sleeping with to gain a certain level of literary career, I also th thought that um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's real in many countries, um, in, um, in many national environments um, today, in, even in 2021. Uh, and for example, when I got that uh, prize, that Anna mentioned, debut prize, I was also asked um, about who's that person whom I slept with. And there were several candidates mentioned and there were lots of rumors. And this is really funny because um, uh, in Russia, um, the, the literary environment is mostly facilitated uh, by women. I mean, editors, librarians, um, those who are um, doing some everyday routine work in magazines and newspapers, um, organizing events, doing PR and so on. So um, there's almost nobody to sleep with uh, unless you are a lesbian. <laughs> and, uh, but at the same time, if you talk about writers or stars or those who are um, welcome to a stage, they are mostly men. And this is a problem that um, notwithstanding all these different social experiments, including a big socialistic experiment of introducing women to, to the forefront and avant-garde of the work, um, in, on intellectual arena, uh, men are still reigning, they are still taking sway. And there's this archetype or a general perception about a writer. When you say word writer or an author, you usually imagine a man with a beard and um, with all his retinue and who are usually women. He, he usually has a muse or a wife or a concubine who are serving him, who are preparing him manuscripts, uh, recording his interviews, answering his emails. And um, even if you talk about um, Soviet times when there was a a whole nomenclature of our um, so-called union of writers, and it was all uh, formalized and organized. There was a special term for a wife of a writer, and there wasn't any term for a husband of a writer. So a writer was supposed to be um, a man. And uh, that is why it's a, it's a still of zone of constant sexual harassment as well, as Russia have very finally have told us and when Russia was talking, I also, um, I also, also uh, thought about a couple of uh, crazy dudes um, I have met in my life, including one writer from Kuwait in one of the international residency. And I remember him um, introducing me to his, um, to his room to, to, to discuss literature. Um, and when I refused to do it, um, he canceled the invitation to Abu Dhabi International uh, Book uh, Festival that uh, he had sent me before it because he was on a board of that, uh, of that uh, festival. And uh, there was another uh, uh, quite well-known uh, Russian writer who was trying to molest me uh, when I was very young and he was twice my age and it was very cold winter evening, minus 20 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, and he was imposing himself uh, on me. He was drunk. He was uh, stinking of garlic and whatnot. Um, and um, it was so hideous uh, and abominable that I pushed him and he fell. Um, and I left him there falling on, on, a, on icy or um, road and uh, I ran away and of course it was a um, foundation for a long-lasting revenge of his and every time I was mentioned in press or on radio he was doing everything he could to censor me to cut my name out of 
uh, programs he was in, and he was everywhere. He was controlling, he was uh, hosting, and uh, it took almost 10 years for him to calm down and um, to put that uh, episode away. And um, I think uh, almost every female writer can, um, uh, can remember, ha have these uh, or such episodes in her uh, memory, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, this perception of a writer as a male was one of the reasons for me taking a male pseudonym on, on the dawn of my uh, literary career when um, I was submitting my manuscript as an unknown author under 25 and I was looking for a nickname or a pen name uh, and I, um, I chose a male name uh, for this uh, very reason because if you think of a writer, you think of a male and um, when my personality has been revealed, it sparkle, uh, sparkled a, a, a long discussion about uh, female syntaxes or uh, style or, or um, literary, um, literary manner. And um, there were different experts uh, ruminating on whether you can determine um, the, the, uh, the, the, the sex or gender of the author uh, just reading a page from his novel or a poem. Um, if um, uh, women express themselves differently from, from men, if they use more adjectives, they are less dynamic uh, in their uh, fiction, as they put it. Um, and also, um, it's um, the worst thing is that even women think badly about, uh, about other women or women's ability to write or to create something new. And I heard from many um, female um, observers, readers and experts uh, that um, female writers usually pick up from a narrower circle of topics, that they are interested only in love, uh, only in uh, petty uh, topics of, uh, I don't know, love triangles and domestic life and um, and uh, that, that's the thing, trying to persuade our own uh, fair sex that <laughs> we, we are able of doing more than, um, than it is perceived uh, generally. Um, and uh, also when you travel, um, and I mean in, in Russia, when you travel across the country and when you talk in different smaller towns um, outside Moscow, you can easily um, feel this um, attitude of the audience that they that they don't pay you um, the same uh, the same tribute as they do to uh, to male authors. So if a man writer, uh, if a male writer comes to a small town and talks about his books, um, almost the whole audience falls in love with him because it consists of women and. Um, and they are mostly uh, lonely women, and uh, this gen um, this um, um, disbalance in the population uh, when uh, there are much more uh, women in in country rather than men. It also reflects itself in literature as well. Uh, when um, when um, or, or male authors are clapped and um, they are um, uh, really perceived on a higher level rather than um, female authors. And also when they start asking questions, when there are Q and A's um, after readings in libraries and so on, most questions refer to female authors and I experienced it many times, are very private, are even intimate and quite rude. When they start asking you about your family, if you are married or not, if you have children or not, and uh, very often I try to joke and uh, to answer that you know I have two imaginary children or something like this, but they take it very tragically, and usually there's a big pause of uh, consolation and contempt. <laughs> um, so. Um, uh, forgive me for my chaotic <laughs> storytelling today, but um, 
this topic is is really very emotional and um, I'm really happy to see you all and to listen to your stories and um, I hope that our audience is um, enjoying this evening with us. Thank you so much, Alisa. Really, I mean, I this struck a chord in so many ways. I was just writing down things that you said, you know, that you said, which relates to all of our experiences. Uh, and, and what you said about being introduced as charming or talented, very frequently at festivals. I was also speaking about this on television today, yesterday. And I, I talked about how when very frequently women were um, introduced as not only is she beautiful, but she is also very talented. The editor of the of the television program also wanted just to add at the very end that he wished that this would have happened to him. You know that this this ugliness to say that you wish to be objectified and um, is 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 so crude and rude. And then um, this um, being called only by at least in the Balkans. Men writers are normally referred to with their last names, and then when they're women, they're kind of only with their first names. I see that is also with my students when they talk about poetry, where they're like they'll say Emily was a great writer about Emily Dickinson, but they'll say, but they'll never say Edgar was a wonderful poet of the American of American Romanticism, right? They'll say Poe and Emily, and you know that's so that's one way. Another thing is that they they do the, do this thing with the intimate questions and the very end they've all you know asking me whether I have a husband or children is just so common also and then um, they ask us to explain feminism they they get very offended by what we say about women's rights all of them I, I find even like at interviews once the cameras are off all the cameramen are just kind of joking around and asking me things about women's rights and then there's um, they, they, they approach us and they interrupt us and they mansplain, like literally on the street. This also happened to me in Lana Bastashic. I mentioned her so many times because we've been to these festivals together where we jointly have experienced such things where once the, um, you know, the organizer of one of the festivals, uh, when we came together, uh, we arrived at one reading, he said, oh, you came to adorn the festival. So, you know, this is... <laughs> You know, these are th these are constant experiences with women, and they're actually quite painful. But of course, there will be someone who will say, "Well, you know, you can't take a joke." Like with Russia, you were saying about that guy. Uh, I don't know who it was that uh, your Montenegrin friend um, reported the incident to. So, yes, and going back to, uh, I'm sorry. No, no, please. Okay, uh, going back to two things that um, Alisa and Fiona. And now I'm using your first names <laughs> as our guests uh, mentioned during their stories. Alisa mentioned um, how uh, the literary guru, or how should I call him, always has a wife or a um, lover or a muse or a concubine who serves him and so on and takes care of him and uh, gives him all, adores him, gives him all her love. And there was uh, a few years ago, I believe this movement or hashtag started, uh, I, I have to read it because I keep forgetting it, but thank you for typing, which revealed that very often uh, women are the ones who do all the typing of the manuscripts, uh, arrange, answer all the emails and even do the research. And they're almost never included in the credits for the, for the work, whatever, regardless of whether it is a theoretical or a work of fiction. And that takes me back to how uh, Mary Shelley uh, was, uh, her um, authorship was contested uh, and people thought that her husband wrote uh, her novel, where usually it is the other way around. Women are the ones who contribute without being credited or without being, you know, without even being uh, given a simple thank you. They're completely invisible in huge bodies of work. So yeah, I really, that really uh, struck a chord. Well, I'm so happy that you were here. You're all also my friends and, uh, you know, and not only do I admire you as writers, but you're also, I feel very close to you. And I hope that uh, you all will be translated into Macedonian and that you can come and visit us here. And I'm so happy that you came and that you opened such important, um, you, that you, you opened these important conversations and issues that we could all discuss today. So thank you for sharing your stories with us.
Thank you very much. Yes, for painting, painting this wonderful pictures. It's lovely when writers tell stories, you always feel as if you've seen them, although they're only talking. And that's one of the things that I really love about Peach Bridge when we have uh, writers as guests. And uh, just um, to say that we're very happy that this is one of the many Peach Bridge events that we've had because of the pandemic, we've gone online, which has enabled us actually to do this. So, okay, we've used it in a positive way. Um, and uh, Peach Bridge is an initiative uh, for women's storytelling that we uh, co-organize with uh, the organization TIT Inc. Uh, and we'd like to thank them and, and say hello to them because they're here behind the scenes. We'd like to also thank Nina Tunkin for um, uh, helping us with all the technical issues. And we'd also uh, like to thank, of course, Kvina Tilkvina, who have supported us um, to uh, make all these events happen. And thank you, Koma Design Studio, because they did such an amazing job. <laughs> As always, yes. Yes, with the promo materials. Okay, ladies, thank you all so much again. And that would be thank awesome. you. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.